We were originally founded by Kelly Weaverling, and uh, for the past 10 years or so, we've had talks in conjunction with Prince William Sound Science Center C Grant, their Tuesday night lecture series. Uh, so we're very thankful to them for letting us be a part of that series. And typically, we have our talk and meeting the third Tuesday of every month. And our meeting's very brief, don't worry. You'll see it's about five minutes. And then it's followed by a talk by a very interesting speaker like Lisa. So, um, as I mentioned, I'm president of the Audubon Society Milo is our vice, Milo Birch is our vice president. And Anita Smyth is our secretary treasurer. And we're always looking for people uh, to serve on the board or to take over one of our positions. So, um, I did want to mention tonight, I panic out to most of you who came in, that uh, City Council is voting on Ordinance 1135 on Wednesday, October 7th, so that's two weeks from tomorrow. There's a public hearing, uh, the 15 minutes before at 6.45 p.m. And this ordinance would lease with an option to purchase a breakwater fill site at the entrance to the harbor. And there has been a lot of opposition to this. I'd say there's been 50 letters against to the five letters for, uh, 50 letters that is against the sale. And um, I think, I'd like to thank and acknowledge Robert Beadle, who has been very vocal, um, very vocal in his opposition and has consistently voted against this sale. Um, so if you want uh, to see this, continue to see the breakwater feel publicly owned, I'd urge you to send an email to the city clerk addressed to city council. You just say, dear city council, I'm against Ordinance 1135 and say your reasons or whatever. Or if you're for it, say you're for it, whatever. But anyways, uh, the email would go to the city clerk and you have to do it to be included in the packet. It has to go in by a week from tomorrow by noon. We're very strict about that cutoff time for it to be included in the packet. If it does pass on October 7th, rest assured, uh, we've already started uh, all the moves to do a petition, a referendum, a petition for a referendum which would mean if we get the uh, required number of signatures, which I think is going to be 170, uh, it will appear then on the ballot in March, and the people can decide whether or not they want to celebrate Waterfield Lot. So I do want to bring that to your attention because it is a hot topic and it affects all of us. It is right at our entrance. Um, one of the other things we always do at our meetings is we ask for wildlife sightings. You know, who's been seeing what? It can be birds, marine mammals, or whatever. And I will start with one that I got from a phone call today uh, from Rocky Stone. Uh, she and Sully were out at um, Hartney Bay this morning and saw a northern flicker, the yellow shafted um, uh, subspecies. And she wanted to make sure I mentioned that tonight. And um, I was out at Eak Lake uh, Sunday. And the, typically this time of year, uh, we get a flock of primarily scop. And it's out there now, up by the head, about 100 of them mixed with some other, uh, some buffalo heads and other birds like that, other waterfowl. And there's all, already about 40 trunk swans up there at the um, head of Eak Lake. So does anyone else have anything to report? Gerald or? I guess we were seeing the picket in our neighborhood. Yeah, see the I saw a flicker up on the ski hill. Oh, oh, did you? OK. Anybody else seen marine mammals or? Flocks of cranes, sand hill cranes coming through. Or, I was out of town for two weeks, so I, I don't know if the cranes already came through. Very, they came through. Going. A lot of them came yeah. through. Yeah. That I saw, like, when I was out on the Alleghenic for a couple of days, they were coming through. Mm -hmm. Pretty big numbers. Yeah, they were maybe a couple hundred, not mm -hmm. the huge gazillions. <laughs> yeah. Well, they used to roost at night on the East Delta, and now that, you know, post earthquake that's grown up so much, so I don't know that they're using that as much. But, uh, yeah, so any other offspring? Yeah, Bill. Um, just last night, we actually kind of back by um, AC store. There was a gouger in there. Oh. It just seems like a little bit late for them to still be coming no. through. No, well, yeah, that is a little late. Cause, yeah, we used to see the juveniles coming throughout at Egg Island more like the 3rd through the 5th of September. So yeah, it is late. My guess is it's a juvenile because the adults leave right after they finish nesting mm -hmm. and catch. Yeah, you know, it's just single. Yeah, interesting. So a lost juvenile voucher. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well then, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Lisa Weber, born and raised in Cordova, and now a world adventurer 
going, I can't keep up with everywhere. I, I guess I know of Norway and Madagascar and Thailand and a few places in between. And tonight she's going to tell us about when she went and lived in Madagascar for a few months. So without further ado, Misa. Hi. I had more time that I could put into this. If I, if it was up to me, I would have had all the time in the world. I would have put like a month into it because I put my heart and soul to this project, and I really loved it. And up until yesterday, which was my last day of work, I've been slammed busy. So, I um, feel free to make this very interactive. Ask questions whenever you want, and I know probably swing up, swing me off on tangents that I'd love to talk about. But um, yeah, so the. Six months up before I made it down to Madagascar, I, I guess I started on that exchange program in Norway. Didn't totally love it, and I ended up bailing in school and kind of bumming around Europe for the next five months. Um, I was teaching English and au pairing, kind of. Uh, I was teaching English and um, watching people's kids and cleaning houses for a free place to stay around Europe. So that was pretty neat. I was in Germany for a month and Slovenia for a month, and a little bit around Austria and Italy, and Hungary for a month. And throughout that time, I was trying to prep for Madagascar, which was extremely difficult, because I was backpacking, but I was also planning a backpacking trip for a completely different environment for the next three months. So I had to buy all the gear that I have at home, but didn't have, you know, I had like my nice cute clothes gear up in like a little suitcase, and I was having to buy hiking boots and a tent and sleeping bag and sleeping mat and all this medical equipment trying to visit clinics to get certain vaccinations that I never ended up getting. Um, and so that was a challenge. So I ended up leaving um, Budapest and went down, um, made the long trip down to Madagascar. And I, I guess I'm not here, I'll show you guys So, I ended up flying into the Montana Rio, which is here, which is called Tana for short, it's such a mouthful. And from Tana, we flew down to Tolanero, which is also known as Fort Duffin. And um, from Tolanero, we made the bus drive up this road. It was everything you'd imagine a bus drive through Africa. It was slam packed. I actually don't even know if I have a foot on here with buses. But there are these giant, there is these giant open vans with 50 people crammed in them. When I had to hang back in Tolanero for a few days while my whole group left up to St. Louis because I was, didn't have my tetanus shot updated. So they said, you can't go, this is very serious, you need to go visit our clinic and get a tetanus shot. So I stayed a few days, waited, I, you know, made the two hour long walk to the clinic in the city. Uh, talked to a few nurses, they said come back the next day and they'll give you the shot. They would like basically expedite this vaccination in from South Africa. So I went to the clinic the next day and they, the doctor, the regular doctor, she was South African, she wasn't in. It was three Malayash nurses that had no professional training. Okay, here we go. And they pull out this block of ice and start chipping away at it and then the vaccination is in the middle. <laughs> and so they kind of get to it, try not to break it, it's like a rock. They're banging at it, this block of ice, and they get this little vaccination. And they pull out these uh, syringes. They're very cheap looking. Um, they break every time they go to pull out a little bit of the vax, a little bit of the liquid. It kept on breaking, it kept on breaking. And so they're like, okay, these aren't going to work. So they go and they grab this, they open this ancient looking cabinet with nothing in it but this giant syringe. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was way too big. I mean, if, uh, apparently you only need a tiny bit of this, of this vaccination. And it was a huge room. I was getting pretty nervous. <laughs> and so they take what they need out of it, and they have no idea what they're doing. They're just like arguing back and forth on how they think this, this should happen. And they just slammed in my head. That was that. You know, they're like rubbing their fingers in it, like not washing their hands at all, rubbing their fingers in my hip, and just like slamming in there, call it good. So that was one of the sketchier medical experiences. So 
So once that got sorted, I was in the clear to go to St. Louis. So I went by myself, walked, it was walk around Tolan Arrow. It was about, maybe, it's really hard to gauge. I think it was about 80 to 100,000 people there in that city. And, um, and I found this bus stop that I needed to get to, and I got in this bus with probably 50 other people, and I had a woman sitting on my left shoulder, and my other part of the body was hanging out on the bus for six hours. <laughs> um, it's only about 50 miles, but it took about six hours. So you can imagine what the roads were like. We were on five miles an hour punch at the time. Um, down here is my just iPhone picture taken out of the plane here over Colin Arrow. And then this is a just of the internet above St. Louis. So the village is about right, there's three little villages that make up St. Louis, and it's about here, here, and here. Um, just quick geography over the island. There is this mountain range that goes from north to south. And all the humidity builds up, of course, from the Indian Ocean, and it can't quite make it over that mountain range. So it's very lush, dense, green tropical rainforest on the east side, and dry desert for the most part on the west. Um, you've all seen it, about the bobat trees. Uh, those trees with very big swollen trunks and like the fewest branches on the top, and they basically, there's not in our area. Uh, bobabs are most popular, or most found down here, but uh, now it's just right here. But very, very different climates and ecosystems just across those mountains. Um, and those bobabs, they you know they they hold, they retain all those waters. So they're just huge, swollen trunks. And very cool. I wish I could have seen them. I was out of money by the country. Um, quick history. Geographically, the island's been isolated for 88 million years. A lot of people I think maybe assume that Madagascar is broken off from Africa. It is broken off from India and made its way all the way from India. You can see it fits like a puzzle piece in India. Um, and it, made, it drifted all the way towards uh, Africa, and in between there is the Mozambique Channel. A very strong currents and tides, as you can imagine. You know, you, you can imagine the way, it, the way it pushed the ocean floor in front of Africa. It's got very crazy tides and weather. All sorts of interesting storms between the um, the Mozambique Channel. So the first human evidence is around 2000 BC, but it's actually very recently been settlements in terms of history, long term history. Um, first the Austronesians, and then people from East, Eastern Africa, Tanzania, and like that. Uh, the French colonized in the 1800s, and they recently got their independence in the 60s. Uh, French is still the official language and the French still completely rule the country. Um, it was really hard to see. It's another, just another country where the rich white men from the Western countries, you know, went there and found their wives, you know, got their male their wives, and you just were constantly, it was completely normal to see 80-year-old men walk around with 20-year-old prostitute wives a lot. And that was the only way out, you know, out of our feet to get to the so. You know, people like girls like me that made that decision for better life, so it was kind of kind of hard to see. But it was very normalized. Uh, there's 21 million people, and Madagascar is about half the size of Alaska. Imagine 21 million people. I mean, that's there's a lot in the world, but just to put it in perspective, 21 million, about the size, half of Alaska, increasing 3% each year. Uh, we were doing our best to the Ozzy the program I worked with was trying to create awareness for women. Birth control is pretty taboo there still, but it's slowly becoming introduced and accepted just because the population is out of control. And it's and it was also conflicting with their culture, which as soon as girls get on their menstrual cycle, they're expected to have children and make a lot of them because their survival rate is so low. Um, Pat, you know, in their babies, four out of ten children will die in the rural areas before they're three. So they're expected to make a lot, hoping you know, as many as they can will survive adulthood and then take care of them. 92% um, live on less than $2 a day. Uh, they're ranked 55 out of 187 in the Human Development Index.
terms of ranking and poverty. 50% of the children under three suffer from retarded growth due to chronically inadequate diet. One in 10 die before five from preventable diseases and four in 10 in rural areas. And a lot of it is very preventable from things like the vaccinations. And you know, the, the most common killer of babies is just diarrhea, things that are super preventable. But um, yeah, it was, it was kind of hard to watch. So, biodiversity, 5% of the whole world's biodiversity is not just on the island, and 80 to 90% of all of that is just endemic, so only native to that island. So, like, try like wrap your mind around the statistics. 80 to 90 is just found there, and 5% of everything is there. And we, there's not that much research on it, we've hardly touched the surface. Uh, for example, 12,000 out of the, or 10,000 out of the 12,000 felt farm species are endemic just to Madagascar. Um, and 90% of the forests are lost. So try to think about 90% of like, just the tree ash being gone. I mean, what would be left? The population is skyrocketing. More and more people are being born every year, but the resources that they depend on are just plummeted. They're gone. 90%. And they, you know, mostly rely off the forest versus the ocean. The seas are pretty heavy there, um, and they don't really have boats like we do. You'll see pictures of their little canoes later, but they can't pin off those in the ocean as much as we do on the warm land. And it's 90% gone. Um, and everyone here knows David Attenborough. I hope. Uh, he's the voice of. Blue planet, planet Earth, all of that. He's been knighted in England. Uh, <laughs> he put it into good words. He said, Madagascar is an unrepeatable experiment, a set of unique animals and plants involving in isolation for over six million years. We are still trying to unravel its mysteries. How tragic would it be if we lost it before we even understood it? And he actually did, I think it's still, it might still be on Netflix. He did a really, really, really good, I think my mom bought it for me. Bought it from when I was in high school, a really good um, documentary on Madagascar that he funded and is the voice of. He has a particular interest in it. So, what's already extinct are all the giants. Uh, the giant lemurs, they're about the size of um, orangutans. The elephant birds, I mean, you can see in comparison to people, they're, you know, they're <coughs> Um, Alaskapo and the giant fossa, which the fossas today are, you know, it's no one really sees them. The locals might see them here or there. There's less than, I think there's less than 300 on the whole island now, and they're mainly found in northern Madagascar. Um, and they're pretty little. They're kind of, a lot of this might ring a bell from the cartoon. I haven't seen the cartoon. I really put Madagascar on the map. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so the fossa, um, that's, Critically major. So, Azafati is the program that I did my internship with. A little bit loud for me, sir. I don't think the time did. Um, <coughs> Azafati is the internship that I did my program with. They are based out of the UK. They are a nonprofit that's based in Fort Dauphin or Tolanero. And they've got an office in England as well. And I literally, how I found them is nothing special. I Googled internship in Madagascar and I clicked on it and then I did it. So that's my story. <laughs> um, yeah, so the internet. <laughs> but they were incredible and um, they really opened my eyes up to how difficult it is to run a nonprofit and how much money it takes. And um, <coughs> yeah, so Azafati means please. It, it, in, the, in their language, it's not as, I want to say it's not as developed, but one word will have a million meanings depending on their tone of voice. And Azafati, it, you say it for anything to say, to get someone's attention if you bump into them or trying to get by them, you say Azafati, Azafati. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, it directly means, it directly translates to, may it not be taboo to me. And the Malagash are very polite 
respectful people. Taboo is a huge thing um, amongst them. It, they're, they seem, they always seem very like self-critical of their actions. If they did something that they thought might have been, they kind of they like, beat themselves up a little bit. It was, it was kind of interesting to see. You couldn't, you know, if anyone was eating on the floor, you could not walk near them, you know, within five feet because they know it's going to be unsanitary to walk near their feet because they have the tables or walk near their food. Um, the people were very polite, especially in the rural areas. In urban areas, anywhere you go in the world, people are going to be more rude, you know, they're going to, they're just not going to be as polite, but in the rural areas, they treated us so, so well. They're such good people down there, and they're very happy. Um, and that was our group. So this was the pioneer group and my group, which is the conservation group. The pioneers focused on building uh, public laboratories, uh, schools. They were more the builders. And then there's a conservation aim group, which is what I was in. So this was right in the this was right at the end actually. This is our last day together, and we were all back in Polonero. But this was our our um, ACP group. So we had uh, Nessa from Ireland, and she was kind of running the show a little bit. She had she started there volunteering a few years before, and then she came back to do her master's, and she was um, the, the main research assistant. And then we were all three-month volunteers. That was Jay Kuzigu, um, out of from England, and Simon was from Sweden. And these guys are all from the area. Saraiki and Hubi were two of our guides. And these boys, they came to our English classes and helped out with us. And they were trained to be eco, um, eco tourist guides as well. So, um, in, uh, in ACP, we focused on hands on field work, focusing on lemurs, reptiles, amphibians, community English lessons, and environmental education. We worked to integrate scientific research with community conservation. So, it was very much a team, um, team <coughs> development. It wasn't at all us trying to educate them, that drives me nuts when people go places to educate others. They they educated us. And we were just trying to work together with our resources and their local knowledge to find a more sustainable livelihood than what was going on. We'll get into that. So our daily routine was wake up at 6. 6.30 was breakfast. 7 was leave for our first transect. I'll kind of go into what we did there. Uh, return to camp from 11 to 12, and 12 was lunch, and while we were eating, we would be prepping for our English and environmental education class. Leave for a second transect, return at 4 for, um, hey, just relax a little bit, dinner is at 5, and then at 7, it'd be pretty dark. It's pretty close to equator there, so it wasn't super seasonal, it'd be pretty dark by 7. And the sun would just be going down and be pitch black, about 7.30 really, 7.45. We'd do our last transect, and then we'd return anytime between 10 and 11, 12 at night. We did the last transect in the dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was I your mean, it's food? Sunday off. Excuse me, what was your food in your meals? All right, it was very, very, very basic. Um, we had rice, mainly rice, lots of rice. <laughs> and um, we had some potatoes. Beans. And beans, rice and beans. It was rice and beans, three meals a day. And it was kind of funny, it was really interesting to see, because we were working hard. I mean, you can see our days were very long. We were walking 20 miles a day every day in blistering heat. And at first, my meals, I would just, you know, I'd come, I was coming, you know, coming off the boat, eat like every 10, 15 minutes, right? It's not so much. And we had to go six, seven hours without eating. That was really hard for me. And we'd be working real hard. And so at first, my meals were just like piled high. Like I just needed as much beans and rice as possible. And then as time went on, my meals got smaller and smaller. I got less and less hungry. And by the end, I only needed like a little bit. And I'd be stuffed. And I don't know if that was my body just adjusting to what that's what it really should be like. Your diet doesn't need to be massive. And then you, you just adjust to the... I did lose a little bit, I definitely lost a little bit of weight probably because I wasn't eating enough nutrients, but it surprisingly wasn't, there wasn't as much fruit or seafood that you would think either. It was pretty just slim pickings. 
and the people, one of the reasons why they're nutritionally starving is because all they eat is cassava. Mm. Or cassava. Yeah, it's that it's com completely, it's basically nutritionless uh, ground vegetable type deal. Um, it, there's not really any nutrients to it, and it, this one of the reasons they're slash and burning the whole area is to grow these cassava. It's the only really thing they'll grow in that area, a little bit of pineapple, but they'll just sell those because they're always good money. Good money, like a dollar. So those, a few families will, you know, they'll, they'll grow a few pineapples here and there and sell them to the other villages, but for the most part, they pretty much just eat cassava. And they fill their bellies on that, and they, I think maybe they, they think they're full, they get a lot of that, they're doing good, but they will be completely nu nutritionless, they'll still be a swollen belly even if they stuff their face with that every night. So, um, trying to share knowledge on nutrition and diet was also, they found very interesting. Um, Lisa, how about, so no meat? No. So this was also the very frustrating part is they had Cebu, so they, they, had, they did have cattle. Not a lot, but there is one, usually like one huge, pretty good sized herd, 40 or 50, uh, that they would, that they would, what's the word? Herd? Herd. Herd them out to the field during the day and then herd them back at night. And, but they generally just used Zebu for sacrifices when someone died. People died all the time, and they wouldn't eat them. So they're starving. Kids are dying from malnutrition, and they're not eating their beef. So that was really hard to watch. And they're big. You'll see pictures of them. They're big. They're big old cows. So that was kind of a bummer. You couldn't tell them otherwise. People had tried, and they won't listen. Uh, they're very, very superstitious. They believe more in the afterlife um, in, in this rural area. They're very Christian, but in the rural areas, they're very traditional in their beliefs. You know, they still, each village still has their shaman that they put their heart and soul into, and a lot of shamans are total scams. And they won't, and they will refuse to believe otherwise. So they'll put every little dime they have in saving their baby, and the shaman will just take it and not be practicing their traditional medicine. And then, and we'll be urging them, just go see a doctor in the city, go see a doctor in the city, and they won't, and it's, it's hard to bring in modern medical practices to them, and they believe so strongly. And their traditional beliefs, so, um, what was your question? Just about me. Yeah, yeah answer it. Yeah, so they, they, so they would, they believe more in the afterlife, so in the south, they're worse. They will put every penny in these massive stone temples. They'll build these huge temples, they'll bury one person in, you know, an elder, someone who deserves to be that big. And, um, and, you know, that'll be their one for the year. They'll go into this temple and they'll sacrifice a few cows and they won't eat them. Focus on the ones that are alive. You can't tell them that. Um, it's a sense of something. It's, it's so what ossified. Do, what do you do on the transects? So, yeah. So, yeah. So, I'll go into that now. So, we did um, a few different things. We did herb sweeps. So herpology, for those of you who don't know, it's the study of amphibians and reptiles. We do herp sweeps, and those we did more often at night, but we basically just scan the forest floor. We'd go in like one line, try to keep a straight formation, and just walk through and go real slow and try to find detail on everything and find any herp that we could find. And there's surprisingly not a whole lot that's poisonous down there we didn't have to worry about. Frog, snakes, we can pretty much handle all of to learn how to. They're mainly just ground boas, nothing real dangerous. And some tree boas too. But we wouldn't handle those at first, but the guides handle them. And then we could hold them. And so we would get these, whatever herb we could find, we got really good at catching frogs, like really, really good. And um, catch them, see if we can catch them, identify them. A lot of Herps will play dead, they'll be perfectly fine, they'll play dead as just survival instincts, which makes it really easy to look at them for a few minutes and then release them. Be as quick as we could, um, find out if it's a male or female, look at its markings, find out what species it was, take a few measurements, see where it was located on the leaf or a tree on the ground, or um, 
kind of yell it out, we have one person be writing everything down, we kind of trade on that. Um, and then we can come up on a good night, we find uh, 120, 130 herbs in an hour, between like five of us or so. Um, so that was really fun. I loved herb sweeps. And it, we kind of made like a comp competition amongst ourselves to like, and I'm very competitive, so I got really into it. Uh, not only how we could catch, but memorizing all the scientific names of all the species. So there's like hundreds. And we got, we got, we were, we, we knew a lot of it. It was really fun. Um, my favorite, it just sounded cool, it was my favorite frog, was the, oh, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Plepidontogila by Pancata. And it was a beautiful, big, fat frog. It had a huge body and like a little cute face, and it had these neat markings under its arms and, um, and two behind its eyes. That's why it was by Pancata. Um, and yeah, that was just really fun. It was surprisingly fun. I think everyone would be surprised at how neat the pursuits were. I didn't. I thought it would be just no lingers. Uh, the frogs stole my heart. So um, that was neat. And then we did uh, lemur behavior. We would go until we found a group of lemurs. They're very social. They're always in groups. Go until we found a little family, and then we'd follow them. Pretty much no matter what, we'd just be as quietly as we could, bushwhacking through. Follow them for an hour every five minutes, write down our location on the GPS, write down their behavior, if they're eating or not, how many there are, if they're nursing, this and that, what they're eating, if they are eating, um, and then we would kind of map out their trails and at the end of the day. How many would be in a group? Mm, Anywhere between three and uh, eight. Yeah. Um, very, very social. The way I think of lemurs is a, they're a perfect combination between humans and cats. Their <laughs> mannerisms, they're, you know, they, they kind of creepily look like people sometimes, like their mannerisms, but they're so cat-like. They're very curious and they're like, they'll come up and they'll look at you for a while and check you out. But they think cat, cat, cat people. Um, <laughs> and then we did also lemur transects, so that mopped population density. So we would walk along these transects, these trails uh, that, would, that had been made by the locals previous just from being in the area. We'd walk along these mapped out trails that were very, very, very confusing and we would definitely get lost every single time without feeling like it weren't for our local guys who gave us a Reiki. And so we'd walk on these transects and we'd just basically see, we'd yell out, not yell, be quiet, <laughs> see how many Lemurs of any species, whatever we find, mark it down, mark down the, the coordinates and whatever it was and what they were doing there. About how far they were from the trail, we'd have to measure, everyone we saw would have to measure from the transect to the tree that they were in and then gauge how high up the tree they were. And this generally mapped out the population for that region. Um, and that, we did some palm studies as well. We'd go check on the endangered palm species occasionally. Um, Palms, palms, um, trees, palms. Um, there's a few very, very, very quick endangered that we kept tabs on. In previous years, they planted quite a few. We would go check on their status and see how they were doing. Um, the jungle's very competitive, so it's very hard to plant things in the jungle. You know, everything is competing for light that's breaking through the treetops. And, um, so it's very hard to successfully grow things in the jungle. You have to find a perfect spot to plant a certain palm. Um, pretty aggressive group of one that was, they lived two, three, four hundred years old, they're massive trees. And so they're pretty hard to start fresh with, but you kind of start somewhere. Hi, I've got a question. Is, it, is yeah. it, they know anything, I mean, are they seeing climate change there? Yeah, definitely. And in the beginning, we actually, this is my, this is when I was driving to St. Louis for the first time. We had heard of, uh, it was about six deaths in six days in St. Louis, which is a huge number. It's, you know, about, I think there's about 500 people in these in this village split into three smaller villages and it was all the people that were in the ocean village and this was one reason that we knew we could directly see climate change affecting was the red tides in the Indian Ocean. All over the world are getting more and more toxic due to warming ocean temperatures and the diatoms in the red tides were getting more and more toxic and they were going through the filter feeders um, and fish, and they were then becoming more toxic to eat, and it was 
killing people, and that was the closest thing that we had to the answer. We couldn't confirm that. There is no scientist out there. Most of us are just volunteers. A few other people are just in grad school. We didn't know for sure, but we had heard that the dying toxins were becoming more and more toxic. And it, it dropped, it killed my like 15 people in the first week I was there. Um, so that was kind of scary. We couldn't eat seafood the whole time. So was it Sequatera that they're dying from? That's a, that's a thing that's diatom. I, some, I, and yeah, if anyone else knows anything about it, I did not do enough research on that when I no. came back. Do you, are you very familiar with it? I'm a little bit from Hawaii. It's, it's um, I wouldn't say common in Hawaii, but it crops up every once in a while. Somebody will get sick from eating fish that's um, infected with sequatera, and, and the source of it is from certain diatoms that fish eat. So. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to look more into that because it was <clears throat> really scary for people because they didn't know what it was. And the people are so superstitious that they thought it was other people. When anyone dies, they think it's someone else intentionally killed them, like poisoned them. So, and that is also taboo to talk about. So you can, no one wants to talk about the issue. No one wants to say, okay, what is causing these spontaneous deaths, major fever, diarrhea, dead within 36 hours. I mean, really scary stuff. You can't even, you don't even have time to bring them to the tone arrow to get back normal. And they, and even we had a meeting with the chief, and he said, you know, this is just like personal vengeance in the village. <laughs> so. You're saying stirred up, huh? So, Ilmenite, this is what is being mined in southeast Madagascar. Uh, it's recovered from heavy mineral sands. Uh, you'll see a photo here in a minute. This is what it looks like in rock form, but in Madagascar, in southeast Madagascar, it is it is in the sand that we're getting it from. It's ironic because it's finely ground into a fine white powder. Um, and this is in so many things in their life. It is in cosmetics, it is in all makeup, it's in paint faces, it's in paper, it's in anything that is white. Just like it's kind of heartbreaking. Um, Rio Tinto is the top producer. They had a interesting relationship with Azafati and the people of Madagascar. They were tearing the island up from its roots, but they were trying to make it okay by building schools and boat platforms and things like that. So they, every year they tried to make a huge donation to Azafati, enough that would have lasted us a year. And each year Azafati turned it down. So they just, they're so frustrated by this. Um, this face that they're trying to put on Rio Tinto, but they're really, you know, they're doing the course of the course and they're doing that. So it was frustrating. We had to work with them and, and keep a relationship with them. Um, the revenue, you know, for some billion. QMM was the, the sector that worked in, in Southeast Madagascar. Um, and those are the areas that were working up air, um, parts of the forest. Um, they are ripped up now. They're on the schedule to be ripped up right around the left. Um, so this is Illuminate. This is a kind of a powerful photo. It's just sand. It's just the ground. And that's everywhere. So it's um, a little bit pressure. So the, why would they then focus on the forest if it's everywhere? Um, because it's mostly forest on that eastern side, and it's not as densely found in the western side of the desert. Um, and it, the, the richer nutrient, the, sorry, the richer mineral stock is under forest. I think about what the forest needs to, to grow is, I mean, why, why there's a the forest right here? I'm going to chop that down. It's just the, um, the minerals aren't as rich there. So. I don't know, they were, there was a section of the forest that we were doing heavy, heavy studies on because it was indeed going to be lift up. Um, it's called S7, and we did a lot of research there because we knew for certain that was going to be gone from the year. And there was a critically endangered um, Pilsuma uh, Antinouche, which I will go into. Oops. Yeah, so that you can't stay clean because the black like, stains everything. Oh my god, that was my feet on a clean day. So now I'm going to go into some photos. The kids are darling. You will see some 
swan bellies that make you look sad, but they are very, very, very happy people. A little thrown off by cameras, sometimes they act a little bit serious, but then as soon as it was done, they like ran up to go see it and they were giggling and smiling. Um, Jake, and this is Bafla. Um, you'll, this is an example of growth being stunted. Bafla was 17 and 18, and he looked and was about the height of the eight year old. He was a year younger than Jake. The kid was on. Jake, so. um. What's going on in the top left? This was us just messing around with game cards. Um, what were you? We played cards every spare second we had. That was the only form of entertainment. So I learned a million new card games. Um. This was me in heaven, because I had three frogs in me. There's one hiding underneath my strap. There's a Bufus in my hand, and I can't remember what that, what that one was, but um, that was one of the finer moments in my guess, where I was thrilled. <laughs> it, it got very, very exciting. Um, he got real into it, and I, of course, I can't remember the species, the scientific names anymore. Uh, this is a ground blow. That one was a baby, pretty little. Little chameleon, uh, skink. It's like half snake, half lizard. I can't figure out what it is. This one's a fisherman. They brought us some fish. We all pitched in a bit of money to get the fish. Um, mix up dinner for a night. Um, Men are really strong. They are all shredded. They're all skin and bones, but shredded. Mm -hmm. Their their work. They run 10 miles a day with, you know, 100 pounds of, I mean, they, the work that they do, they're the strongest people I've ever seen. What kind of fish would those be? I don't know. Okay. They wouldn't, they probably had a name, but. Yeah, actually, no, a few months, that's right, a few months into it, we just started eating fish again. When people, when the scare was over. These are the twins, and I love doing that to the back of this guy. Mm. Marcos, he's going to be the president of Madagascar one day. <laughs> so these are all your photos. Mm -hmm. I love this little girl. I got like five of them of her that I'm going to show you back to back. She was my favorite. She was very wild and exotic looking. She had these, her mom had braided these, you know, these like cloth into her hair that looked like they'd been there for a year. And she wore this little skirt as a dress every day. She didn't have anything else. It was an adorable skirt. I love to photograph her. She's always on her own. She's kind of a little bit of a bully even. She's very smart. But beautiful. Uh, as, uh, as a funny, I built this neat well. So the, the, the village does drink water from a well now, before it's from the river, which it's significantly decreased their their deaths. Now that they have clean water to drink, so she's cleaning her face that well. Um, the ones on the sea did, the, the, the people that lived on the ocean did eat a little bit better with their fish. <laughs> I remember it wasn't a thing, and they never had their pants pulled up, so the little boys would always, and the little girls would always walk around with their, just exposed completely all the time, it's just always just below, it's hilarious. <laughs> This is in our, um, so we had an environmental education class on Tuesdays and Thursdays and an English class on Saturdays. 
And um, so we would put together a class plan and our guys, Hubie and Sarecki, would translate for us. And we make, it would be super interactive. I drew a little habitat for frog, um, for, um, habitats for frogs to lay their eggs and they were sticking eggs around. We sang songs before class every day, We'd sing four or five of their songs that they had created themselves for this conservation class in Malgash. It took the whole three months to learn. So were you teaching them English in this classroom? Not in this one. We did it in our English class that um, <coughs> was offered. Let's see, we had kids, we had we had, yeah, we had two English classes. We had one for kids, and we had one for um, more advanced adults. I really loved her, too. She was, she was a little fireball. Um, something is, Pretty, it's pretty sad, it's kind of hard to hear, but they would have so many kids because the rate of death was so high most infants, or maybe four or five, that they would stop feeding some of their children and focus on keeping their others healthy. And this was one that wasn't being fed. So that's, yeah. Some of the kids, some of them will have uh, African influence in their face, some of them will have Indonesian influence. You can just kind of bunch of stuff in the front. It's on very, very different levels. Mm -hmm. See, I like, I like black. It makes it look a little more depressing than it is. <laughs> it's a very different. These women are definitely from the area. Um, that's a standard of itself, you know, something like oh gosh. That was a hairstyle too. That was a trendy way of trendy way to do your hair. Why, why did you say that, Lisa? Hmm? Why did you say they were from this area? I uh, just their, the yeah, their face. Uh, you just kinda got used to seeing the ones that had been there a lot longer first, you know, coming up from the outside for the last few hundred years, kind of year. Um, that is that is your mom actually right there. This was Alpera. He was my favorite. He he was kind of our grandpa at camp. He was also a guy. He was in his eighties. He never wore shoes and he was the most kick ass guy ever. He never ever got lost. He you know he'd been in that area his whole life. Only had one pair of shorts, and he was a total champ. Uh, we really loved him. Altera had 12 kids, and 10 of them had died. And one of them died when we were there, and most of his children, he is from the village by on the water, and most of them had died in the ocean. They were lobster fishermen, and, and standard fishermen, just can't fish, but um, a lot of people, young men, go out fishing and don't come back. It's pretty rough. It's the seas are incredible there for their tiny little boats. I just, it would be scary living on that living that village really. How far were you from the ocean? I was a fort, so that it was split up like kind of 20 minutes or so in between each village. It was like in a straight line, and I was in the one furthest in the jungle. Um, and it was about, yeah, it was about 45 minute walk. But you, you could go there. We would go on Sundays on our day off. We would all, like every Sunday, we would just go to the beach and just relax all day because we'd be pooped. He was very proud of those. Those were, um, it's like condensed milk and like 
shredded cassava root or something that they like cook over a flame and make like a crispy little tree. They love condensed milk there. It's like the one treat. They put it on everything they can. They can get their hands on. This guy was psyched to get his picture taken. <laughs> he had to see it. He was cracking up at the photo for like five minutes. <laughs> So just outside the village is like this huge open plain again. It's, it's pretty open for about 40 miles, 50 miles to get to those mountains. And we would have to walk 10 miles to another patch of forest way in the back. Can't see this photo. It's weird, the forest seems to patch up or just sprout up in areas and then completely stop. Like there'll be nothing. Um, I'm not sure the reason for that, but. I can't remember the name, it was Amban Triki or something. This was the middle village, um, and it was directly translated to the village you wash your feet in. Because people go there and wash their clothes and wash their feet because there was a river that ran through it. There are no uh, crocodiles or snakes? Do there you? are crocodiles. Yeah. Not that common, and they were like the plague to them. If there was ever a crocodile that they saw come up their slough, they would all send a party out to massacre as soon as possible. So we would kind of try to like, uh, but don't, but then they, I mean, they will eat kids. I mean, they're, they are a threat. Um, so if they ever did hear about one, they would try to get rid of them as soon as possible. Would they eat those? Um, I don't think so. I don't think they did because they were very, like, satanic to them. They don't eat anything that they have, like, superstition against. Which, which is a lot of things. So, we'll get into the cleaners. I love this shot. I got really lucky. I just kind of These are ring tail lemurs, ring, ring tail lemurs, of course. Um, the, this is actually at a sanctuary outside Fort Dauphin, Bonero. It is, they are not endemic to southeastern Madagascar, so we didn't study them in their actual wild habitat. They're still wild, this is just a protected area. Um, a sanctuary that was put up by the French in the early 1900s, and some lemurs from around the country were brought down. Um, so we visited this our first week in Madagascar. I would have loved to study them more in the wild, but that's all northern part of the country. The ring tails, because you were doing lemur transects. Mm -hmm. but those are just I was still, we were doing lemur transects on brown lemurs, mouse lemurs, okay. and just not these. Lemurs. Yeah, just not not these and sifakas, which are these are sifakas. Um, beautiful creatures. Um, I was talking about I did a cause I chat I did a few quick presentations at the high school earlier today for the biology class and someone asked why their coats were so thick. I don't really know. The only thing I can think of is to keep the boats off. That's a good question. But it's such a hot place and it's so humid, I can't imagine they've gone all that fur, but the only reason I can think of is maybe the boats. Happy birthday. I don't know. I didn't get my my um my rabies vaccination, so I didn't touch a single mammal for three months. It was really sad. I couldn't even touch dogs or anything. Um, cause, and dogs are also considered um, the devil, basically. Of all things, dogs are the devil. Because they've carried rabies for so long, people have made this superstition around them. If they see a dog, if they even come near a dog, they'll throw stones at it, they'll kill it as soon as they can. And dogs are. A pet dog was completely unheard of, and the saws, like foreigners, saws, weren't allowed to have in the city. They would try to adopt dogs, strays, and then people would go out and kill them. So, very serious. Sivakas are also from northern, mid, mid northern Madagascar. Are they slow or are they? Can they move? They're quick, and you'll see. I have a little, I have a quick video clip, and it's about five minute video, kind of match the clips I put together, and uh, they 
they're very quick, but they hop, but they can hop at like 15, 20 miles an hour. So a little like hop sideways really quick. Mm -hmm. They can't, they're not, they can't, they don't have joints, they can do this like people. Are they tree dwelling all the time? Or do they yeah, they're always more basically. They'll hop if there's a tree that they have to get to. But they, um, oh, it's so cute. It's a little baby, <laughs> a tiny little guy. You can see how small it is. Small, man. And uh, super curious, Cam checked out the camera, reached down, and then his mom started hooting at him. Like, what are you doing? Oh, look at his eyes. He's like, oh, and that caught him right as he looked at his mom. <laughs> This is them kind of in hop. <laughs> this is the bamboo lemur, also not endemic to Southeast Madagascar. These are my only two photos, just thought I'd share them. Um, they live completely off bamboo, and they had a little bamboo forest, and that's and that sanctuary for them. So these are brown lemurs. These are what we did all of our diurnal studies on. What does diurnal mean? Daytime, so they're awake during the day, nocturnal being at night, which the nocturnal ones are mouse lemurs. So we did our behavior, this is what we did our behavioral studies on and our lemur transects on so we could see them. You can't do, we could do lemur, we did do lemur transects at night, but we couldn't do behavioral. So we here, we'd have to follow them through the forest, and that was just too dangerous and pitch black, and it would have been too hard. So some are active at night, and some are active in the day. Mm -hmm. You'll see the difference in the size of their eyes, you know, anything that's dire or nocturnal will have bigger eyes, and they'll be, you'll see how they're adjusted. Really curious things. They're not hunted though. They are occasionally by locals. The, the locals in the area that we were in are pretty, you know, they've had ospy there for 15 years, and they're pretty aware of the situation. They're pretty good, but they are hunted for bush meat when needed, um, and the pet trade drives me nuts when people say they want pet monkeys or lemurs or anything. They get taken out of their habitats, like here. Um, and slash and burn, you know, deforestation, all that, contributing factors. These are the mouse singers. They're kind of creepy with flash on them. They're super <laughs> cute when you see them, and they're like this big. They're like this big, they're tiny. And you see them at night, and they're so cute. Do they call them bush babies, too? That's different. Those are adorable. Those got even way bigger than eyes. Those are, those are really cute. Uh, those aren't from the area, but, um, but they're kind of creepy when you see what the flash on their fingers are all like warty and like misshaped and their noses look like they've been hit with a pan bunch and kind of funny old guys. But they're tiny. We did some chameleon research as well, not a whole lot, but their chameleons are doing fairly good. When they make babies, they do often do by the three, four dozen. They'll um, take over a bush and the whole bush must be completely covered in baby chameleons this big. It's so cute when you see a bush. It's covered in baby chameleons. Um, so this is like an example of one of our herp sweeps. We would kind of measure from the snout to where their tail began. And just to give you a visual here, we put these foam mats up around these trees. Um, Specifically looking for leaf geckos. They're like really, really, you'll see a photo later on. It's a beautiful gecko. We were trying to attract their uh, mating habitat just so we can do some studies on them and then release them immediately afterward, but just trying to find them, see if there's any even out there. Try to see how many were left. They're very, very rare. Um, Pufferfish <coughs> were always floating up on the beaches. I mean, not always, but when they die, they puff up. They're cute. They're dead. Dead. They're dead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Real cute. <laughs> I mean, this is like an awesome example of how cool evolution is. 
that's a caterpillar that looks just like a leaf. Uh, stick bug, full millipedes. These are all your pictures? Mm -hmm. The butterflies mm -hmm. mating. Uh, the millipedes are harmless, as you probably all know. Centipedes were super poisonous. They were really, really big. Um, and their bite would, their sting would be almost as bad as uh, a uh, centipede. A centipede. Yeah, their, theirs would almost be as bad as a um, scorpion. Scorpion, thank you. As a scorpion, which those were pretty common too. That you saw scorpions quite a bit, and those can definitely kill you there. The scorpions were probably the biggest threat to your life. And this is just an example of a night walk. How much you see. So here, some creepy ginormous beetle that was like the size of a fist. Cute little baby killing sleeping. Don't know what these are called. There's almost zero arachnid studies done, especially in this area, so we had no idea what anything was called. It was, I mean, we could have been discovering new species every day and not known. This is a fascinating praying mantis that looks like a deadly uh, cicadas. They're about the one thing I absolutely hate. Because they would, we were attracted to your lights, and we had these torches on our, fit, you know, like strapped our face, and they would go towards the lights. They would bug this big, just like spring at you in the pitch black, and you could not see more cluster from it or freaked out. Hey, <laughs> Scott. Uh, these are the huntsmen. Uh, spiders got about this big. Um, they were everywhere. You don't really have to worry about them too much. The bigger you are, the less likely you are, you are that you're poisonous. They hunt and kill other insects. So they weren't anything to be too freaked out by. This is the leaf gecko that we did those mat, um, that we put the foam mats for. Really cool. If they're on a tree, they completely blend in. Completely. Their chemical is amazing. Okay, so that's it. Um, these are the crows, so these are what they go face the ocean in. Um, it's also the reason why so many of them don't come back. But even these pros, I mean, they can cost the equivalent of like three, four hundred dollars, which is an unfathomable amount of money. I mean, they need a certain kind of wood that doesn't, that they can't find in the area, and it's a huge deal. So there are a few of these around that the fishermen used, and they did lose them quite often, often too. And they use those pros. Um, to get the lobster, and these are the lobster that the fishermen will never taste in their whole life because they are sold for such a high price. So once a week, this jeep from Port Muffin would come down, pick up all the lobster, and bring it back to the city and ship it to Europe and North America and all these developed places that are oh, those very rare, you know, expensive malnourished lobster. And these people will fish their whole lives and never taste one because they're worth so much. And it's still not that much. It's still dirt cheap, you know, we're still talking like five bucks of lobster. But that that goes really far in there, point more than the lobster so they never knew what it tastes like. And it's also being incredibly overfished, the lobster. Um, they're working on efforts to create some sort of hatcheries or something. I was trying to do as much brainstorm as I could down there for the lobster project. Um, at least cut off areas where they couldn't fish for the buoys and nets uh, to protect breeding grounds. They knew that they weren't supposed to um, take female lobsters that had eggs on her and they would scrape them off and take them home. And who's to blame them? You know, it's going to feed them for, it's going to feed their family of 10 for 3-4 days. What would you do? So it's really hard to find a balance and them knowing the situation, them knowing that less and less lobster were there each year but still knowing that they need to feed their families, so struggle trying to find a middle balance. Um, these are really cool to, these are really neat to watch um, when you watch other bugs, you know, watch insects fly, their bucket, bucket plant. Um, you know, they had a really, really slippery rim, they'd fall in, and then they'd just be squirming around, and they'd just basically dissolve, and they had this acid that they would release, and they'd basically just dissolve these these bugs, and they get pretty big. I thought all these look kind of similar to our area. They can pass some more normal, but then you kind of look, stand back and look at the jungle as a whole. And um, I mean, the vines were just incredible. 
pretty intense jungle at a certain time. I and mean, this is like something out of the Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> For those of you that don't know what pineapples look like, they're growing. There's a few families that grew pineapples. Just too much spiders for <laughs> spider lovers out there. Um, they had really, really, really fascinating webs. Some of them, the forest was completely covered. They would cover areas 20 feet wide in between treetops, and I don't know how they got from point A to point B, but they could jump because there'd be canopies the size of like trailers that were spider webs. Um, they were pretty freaky sometimes. Um, this is an example of how intricate they were. These ones could be anywhere between this big to I mean like the size of the table in an open area. They'd have you know they'd have hundreds of little spiders working on one web and like make a community. I mean it's crazy. This was a pretty common design that they made, like a dome in the middle. It was really pretty. These were hairy caterpillars. They were also very poisonous. You'd brush up on them pretty often, and it felt like a hundred wasp stings. They were really painful. Their hairs would stick to your skin, kind of like. Uh, the bulbs do in jellyfish sort of and release a little poison that hurt pretty darn bad. They were, pretty, they were about this big. These are the beautiful dug dug out beetle. It's something weird like that you want to think, but very fluorescent, stunning. We love them. Um, this was kind of a quick example. The frogs would play dead immediately. I always felt bad that they were perfectly fine. Um, and we would, you could tell right here, this is a female. Uh, otherwise, they had very translucent thighs, the skin right there, and you would see like bright white gonads if it was a male. <laughs> so that was just identifying the female. Cute baby And so this is the infamous Felsuma antinouche that was, there was probably, I mean, it's hard to say, but under probably 500 in the wild left. They were only found in one little area. This was the S7 area I mentioned before. This was a separate area that we would have to go and hike and do a little crow canoeing trip to and set up our own camp there, it's away from the village. You thought you were secluded in the village until you got to S7 and that was, in the middle of nowhere, 10 miles away from the other camp. And, um, and we went there specifically to study these because this was a transect that, this was the region that was going to get completely dug up again uh, the next year for mining. So this is a black hole now, this area. And um, this is where, this is the only area that we just found. So we were spending a lot of time on them, um, getting as much behavioral studies as we could to recreate a habitat for them. Probably in a zoo at the moment, but hopefully back in nature to reintroduce them somewhere else in the world that they can survive. Uh, these are the mammals. They're a lot brighter and more beautiful than females, which is common. This is a female on the right. And so we were extremely thrilled because. I am the only person, well, says, the only person that has a video of the Philosophy and English mating on record. And we didn't know that's what was happening. It's very kind of boring <laughs> studying them. You find one, you walk until you find one, which can take hours or not at all. And, you know, we're looking at their key habitats it's inside these little pandanus trees. And you find, if you finally find one, you have to sit there and you have to watch it for like an hour and a half. And sometimes they don't move at all, and sometimes we lose them after five, ten minutes, whatever. And um, we, every five minutes we'd mark down all sorts of behavioral, what they were doing, if they were if they were licking, if they were looking around, if they seemed like they were sleeping, just anything that we could put down we would every five minutes for an hour and a half uh, to know as much as we can about these guys to recreate their habitat properly. 
And uh, we caught their mating, which is really exciting. <laughs> it doesn't excite you, but it was the coolest thing. It started off with um, a male just kind of doing a weird tail flicking, and we, after a while we figured out he was probably sitting out an aroma, and he, uh, and then a female came along. But this is used in some like thesis, thesis statements now. It's a map, so this, this video is used in funding, trying to get out there that this is the only evidence we have of them meeting at all. And uh, there's some projects out there now, I was talking to Nessa about it, um, that she's working on trying to get a legitimate uh, habitat set up elsewhere in the world. So at the end, the female was hurting a little bit. Kind of, yeah, they both claim themselves. This is probably a necessary show, but it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all I have. I wish I had a little bit more. I wish I had more time. But is there any questions? Yeah, what was the... Uh... <clears throat> what is the local music like? Oh, gosh, I wish I knew that. I might. It was, um, that's a good question. It was very good. We actually had like a country famous uh, group that was from St. Louis. Um, it was, they had these beautiful, huge string instruments that was just, it would just be like a two by fours, um, like nailed together that they would somehow make the most beautiful music from. And their voices were very, oh, I'm trying to get you. Um, very loud. The way that the women danced, I'm not going to try to <laughs> recreate the scene of what it would be like when they danced, but they were so quick. They basically like, it would be like river dancing like in fast forward, and they're super strong, incredibly strong. We could not keep up, and they'd be bent down low while they did it, and so they're like this incredible fast river dancing in the sand. And when they party, they party all night long, and they dance like this all night. And, um, and it was very animalistic, all of it, really. They, it was, I mean, they, you know, you could tell it was when the teenagers came out to find their ladies, and, and they, you know, they made families really young, so they had these dances, like, once a month, and they'd get, they'd get their string instruments out and sing and party like crazy. They had very, very cheap rum. You can get a bottle of rum for, like, five cents. It was Malgash rum. It was all sugar, basically, so you have a terrible hangover. But, um, yeah, it's a good question. I have to look it up. I don't have to just finish it. It is really So when you uh, say Malagash, is that referring to a tribe? Or is that yes, a so, island wide? Yeah, so let me explain that. The dialects are very different everywhere. People have been in their region for so long. The dialects are super different. So in the area that I was in, there was a Y at the end of almost everything. It looks like Malagasy. But they never pronounced the Y, and they always switched up the Y with an SH noise. So it's pronounced Malgash. Um, there's a Y at the end of Azafadi, they don't pronounce the Y, they say Azafad. Um, so the dialect there, even if you did learn the dialect there, it would be different in Fort Ruffin until narrow. So it was, I found a hard time, especially because one word would have completely opposite meanings, just depending on the context you put it in. So, um, I found it really difficult. Did that company hire local people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, all of our guides were local. No, um, no, no, no. I mean directly. the mining company. Oh, they they needed to for guides. They, they you know... But like the people doing the work, were they... Local or were they there was a fair from the city that had that they had hired, but um, it's a lot like the oil companies here. They pay so well that people will give up their homeland to 
you know, they won't think twice of money. So the answer is no, there weren't that many There's not a whole lot. Mason would never brag on herself, but I will. She did all this when she was 19, the money she earned herself. There is rice, there is a lot of rice grown in Madagascar, but um, <laughs> it was cheaper to eat imported. Uh, yeah, imported rice. And the cassava, was that a... That was grown right in the region. We but was it an introduced thing. food, or...? I don't know on that. I imagine so. I would think so. I actually don't know how much. I can't remember. How long ago, do you know how long ago that elephant bird was extinct? Um, was it? it's been... It went... Most of those animals went out around the time of the French colonization. It was a lot like what the Russians did to Alaska. It was just great fish, everything. And they killed so many of the elephant birds and all the eggs that had been on the beaches, on the southern beaches, when they when they did go extinct, all of these eggs got washed up to shore and into the ocean and they all broke up and everything and then they all washed back. So the whole southern part of Madagascar, the beaches are literally just elephant shells. That's how many there are. They've got mm -hmm. solid beaches. They're not they're not seashells, they're elephant bird shells. It's fast, and the eggs are about this big, mm -hmm. and you can buy like bottles of them and things now. But they, um, the shell, and I can't believe people haven't gone in and just like scooped them up and sold them or what. But they're solid beaches; they're desolate. I mean, that goes to show few like how little tourism is Madagascar. Two hundred years ago. Yeah, and there's still shells completely made up of eggs. Our beaches. You said it seems like there was an article in National Geographic a while back talking about the illegal logging. And I think it may have been in the northern part of the country. Mm -hmm. Did you see any of that around your area? That's definitely the northern part of the country. There's a certain uh, timber that they shoot for. And there was a huge <coughs> illegal coup in 2009. The whole country fell apart. There was a huge uprising. Hundreds of thousands of people. Bombs went off everywhere. People were dying. There were tens of thousands. Massive bombs. Um, and the government completely collapsed. And so any regulations that were on the forest at the time disappeared. They, they just lifted. There was, there was no law enforcement. So these illegal logging companies, uh, America being guilty, all of Europe being guilty, everywhere, there's this um, very desirable, rare tree. I can't remember the name. Uh, Rosewood, thank you. It's rosewood and tons of rosewood got illegally logged and and a huge part of the forest disappeared in about like two years after that coup. People just went crazy and they went crazy for rosewood. And you can look that up. I saw I watched a few YouTube videos on it. It's really crazy how, you know, everyone that's logging them, everyone's carrying an AK. It was very I mean those trees are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, one tree. So, um, no, yeah, I didn't see it as much down there because there wasn't as many, you know, trees that were on the market, but, yeah. Is there any reforestation efforts? Being we were doing some reforestation efforts, um, and Rio Tinto is planning, they, they keep saying that they're, do they're doing reforestation projects, so they'll have these mass efforts to, but the thing, a jungle is so, you can't rebuild the complexity of a jungle. You know, you could build ours a lot easier from scratch, you really could, but they're so fragile down there. You know, one tree can be the life of, you know, 10,000 creatures on that one tree. You can't just rebuild it. It would take hundreds of years. So there is reforestation efforts a little bit by them, but not until they get what they want. So that's in the future still, because it's fairly new. They're the last decade, I think. Yeah. If you have to picture you on the beach, how cold was the water, or how warm was the water? That water was actually pretty darn cold. That's on, you know, it is on the southern tip. It is actually pretty chilly. It's not that, I mean, it's amazing how hot it was there for how close really you are in Antarctica, really. Yeah, it's pretty cool water. So, Misa, um, can you share with them your uh, class that you were teaching 
the women that were doing the work? Yeah, so there's this group, this woman, Sarah, she was a past volunteer and she fell in love with it so much that she came back, she started this program called Stitch St. Loose and it was focusing on empowering local women to not just be that um, housekeepers of the family basically, uh, but to make and sell embroidery to, for the tourism. And the volunteers, myself included, I probably spent five, six hundred dollars on their stuff, which was really, I basically bought their whole shop. But um, they had, in fact, I'll bring up a few photos of their shop, I'll find one. But this, she, uh, these women, they were on such a kick about, make, you know, being a dominant income. And it was a, it was a pretty big movement for these women, really, at the time. And, um, and I really fell in love with a lot of them. I visited them on all my free time. Their shop was right across from my art camp. And so I started an English class uh, with these women specifically so they can run their own business because what's the point of getting them started on this business and then the nonprofit having to leave one day or lose, you know, have to walk out from not enough fund, funding and then, and then they'll just fall apart. So the whole idea is to put them you know, give them stability, put them on their feet for these small businesses so we can walk out comfortable one day. And they need to learn English. They have to know English to get by um, the tourism trade. So I started an English class with them and I did it with them, I think, four or five nights a week for a few weeks uh, the last month or so. And it was exhausting. I have a whole new respect for teachers. <laughs> it was very, very hard. but. Um, Super rewarding. It was pretty cool. And, um, it's very neat to see results. They have picked up quite a bit of my hand basic, so. I'm trying to find a picture of the shell. When Misa came back, she had a piece of embroidery from each of the women. And I won't go into that sad story about the embroidery. But it, it was really neat. She knew pretty much their whole life stories. So she'd show me the piece and tell me the story of the woman and how many children, what their names were, and what they were like. So that was it. Was just really fun. It's like the all the workers told a story, a story about the, you know, the person. Yeah, their personalities definitely came out in their border. Yeah, by her style, she could recognize it from the border. It's neat. Um, you, 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 you do have a, a name of your video to show, right? Oh, you want to stay? I'll get to that right after this. So um, this, um, this was in the shop. These are, they had bracelets, they had these little belt headbands. They had this very old school looking um, sewing machine that they used. And this created a fairly stable income for them, which is something that they had never, never had before. <coughs> They were making, you know, way more money than the husband. It was just this whole new, they just opened up a lot of them. They sold them in the city. They had some beautiful stuff. These were all pillowcases. So he said, how many people would apply for each position? I mean, they're really sought after jobs. They're, uh, they can only, uh, their first they hired 10, and about 50 showed up, and they can only hire 10 really difficult for Sarah to limit it down to see who needed it the most and who had the most talent. Um, not just most talent, you know, it was, it was a combination of who needs the most money, who needs the most family support, all these things to take into consideration for hiring. So that's Sarah in the back and she was a total saint. She was definitely an inspiration for me. So I will play this video. Do you see clips down there? I saw that. I'm not sure if I've got the sound. How do I get the sound on? Um, it won't hook to the projector. Oh, really? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Crown and Boas, they're pretty harmless. <laughs> Seabirds and plastics. So that should be a good talk. I wish I could remember the exact day. It should be the third uh, Tuesday in October. And Lauren, I don't know who the talk is next week. It is on, I, I can't pronounce his last name. Um, there are three consonants <laughs> right in a row. Um, but it's on music and culture. So it's kind of an ethno tour. Because that will be here again at 7 o'clock. In the Arctic. Yeah. Oh, in the Arctic. Yep. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's here next week, 7 o'clock. So those of you who want to stay and ask me some questions, please feel free. I need to get you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready?